Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it. No matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness Saturday. That means Supernatural News. Parashare is here. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, and that... That handsome, bedeviled bastard is Tim Dennis over at the Supernatural News Desk. Hey, Tim. Hey, how are you? Doing well, doing well. Uh, We have got a lot of stories to cover this week, but I've got to start off with something that, um, well, let me start off with, if you don't mind, I have a regular story that this doesn't really fit into the paranormal. Okay. But uh, maybe it does. Maybe there are superheroes that live amongst us after all, Tim. All right. Okay. 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 Check this out. An an unidentified man was running on Horsetooth Mountain Open Space's West Ridge Trail near Fort Collins, Colorado. Mm -hmm. He had a nasty encounter with a juvenile cougar on Monday, which ended up with the runner wounded. Okay. I heard about this. Yeah. Yep. And the cougar strangled to death. (laughs) How badass are you that you're mauled by a mountain lion? Mm Mm-hmm. And you say, oh, not today, son. And mm-hmm. you choke out a mountain lion mid-eating you. According to the Coloradan, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has confirmed that a male cougar, a puma concular cougar, to be specific, Tim, yep. also known as a mountain lion, a puma, or a catamount, weighing at least 80 pounds, attacked the man and managed to inflict bite wounds to his face and wrist before the tables were turned. And the man managed to suffocate it with his bare hands. That's pretty badass. I'm not going to lie. The runner sustained serious but non-life-threatening injuries in the deeply unfortunate incident. CPW wrote in a statement while wildlife officials took the corpse of the cougar for necropsy. How do you say this? Necropsy. That's what it is. Necropsy. Necropsy. Yep. Right. Per the New York Times. And listen, folks, I love animals like you love animals. All right. But there's, <laughs> you get attacked by a mountain lion. I don't think your your first thought is, oh, no, son, you're going down, and you choke that lion out. Yours is just to swing, scream, and pray to God that it gets bored with you and sees something shiny, right? <laughs> or notices a baby close by and leaves you alone. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that this guy choked it out. Part of the New York Times, a Parks Wildlife spokesperson said that other animals have scavenged on the cougar's corpse by the time they had located it, though officials confirmed on Tuesday that it had indeed died from suffocation. <laughs> and that fortunately it was not rabid. The runner did everything he could to save his life, CPW Northeast Region Manager Mark Leslie said in the statement. In the event of a lion attack, you need to do anything in your power to fight back, just as this gentleman did. According to CNN, a Larimer County Department of Natural Resources said the trails at the horse uh, horse tooth mountain open space were closed on Tuesday due to Rangers' detection of more mountain lion activity in the area. They will reassess the situation on Friday, CNN wrote. That would be, of course, yesterday. That's the craziest thing about the entire story is that the authorities said he did the right thing, that you are supposed to turn and attack back. Yeah. Yeah. That you're not supposed to be passive, that you're not supposed to run, because if you do, you certainly will be killed. You're supposed to turn and fight. Maybe, Maybe with your attitude, you'll be killed. No, no, no. That, I, would that, just, I would run away and not be killed. That's that's the inevitability, because if you turn and run, you you actually expose your jugular faster. Yeah, and, and you make yourself uh, more of a prey yep. at that point. Yep. Yeah. 
Crazy. But uh, though cougars were once hunted to near extinction in the United States, researchers believe that their Western populations and those of other apex predators, such as wolves and coyotes, are beginning to rebound. Scientists once categorized regional populations of the cats as dis, uh, distinct subspecies through that view, uh, although that, oh my God, Tim, words is hard tonight. Scientists <laughs> once categorized regional populations of the cats as distinct subspecies, though that view has diminished due to genetic research in 2000 that concluded that they are all of the same subspecies. According to National Geographic, the eastern variant has declined and blah, 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 boring, boring, boring. The good part of the story was man attack, man chokes out lion. Not Again, not that I'm advocating hurting uh, an animal, Tim. But when it comes to fight or flight, you, you think lion, if you're attacked by a lion, you're pretty much done. You're mm -hmm. cooked. Well, right? a lot of that story, I think uh, what needs to be added to that story, too, and that what we can add to that story is... There are a lot of now responsible hunters that go out there, and it used to be that, and let's face it, a lot of hunters went out there uh, that were irresponsible in, f in former generations that would just shoot at cougars and, and wolves and coyotes just for kicks and would leave the carcasses out there. Um, there are a lot of responsible hunters that are out there that appreciate wildlife for what it is, and they don't do that. They leave wildlife be. Um, I know that I, I may get some emails and letters uh, saying, Tim, there's no such thing. Um, but it, it is true. There are some hunters that are true and pure conservationists that uh, go out there and respect their limits, that go out there and uh, they use the animals that they hunt uh, truly for, for food. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, they use every bit of the animal that they hunt. And they use it responsibly. Some even uh, take what they don't use personally and, and turn it over to uh, homeless shelters. So, you know, there, there's, you know, I, I think that's why you see those populations coming back because uh, there are responsible hunters out there and, and responsible uh, gamesmen that, that do, uh, you know, observe that. Well, that and I released two Schrader cougars into the wild as well, and you know how. Oh, God. Yeah. How they like to procreate, Tim. Yeah, boy, do they ever. Trying to solve your own life's mysteries? Let our sponsor, who has been seen on Good Morning America, help you solve your case. Psychic Source is a 24-7 phone, online chat, and video psychic service. They've been in business for 30 years and have over 300 of the most experienced, authentic psychics in the world. Try it for as low as 83 cents a minute, plus your first three minutes are free and your satisfaction is 100% guaranteed or your money back. You have nothing to lose. Use promo code DARKNESS, D-A-R-K-N-E-S-S, -S, to get the special introductory offer. You must be 18 years or older with a valid credit card in your name to have a psychic reading. Tim, horror movies, aside from The Terminator, have listened to this show. Horror movie writers? Mm-hmm. They are rebooting the Chucky series, the uh, the Child's Play series. Okay. The the first ad came out with um, Tim Matheson, and he's like the president of this company, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, hey, we are at a new place in our history where, you know, things are popping up. Technology has made advancements, and we have created the new ultimate toy. And we're going to be revealing that toy on February 8th and blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So the concept for the new movie is that that Chucky, the Buddy doll, mm -hmm. the B-U-D-D-I doll, right. is actually now an AI creation. Oh. Uh-huh. So they've been hearing your fears, Tim. See, they know. They've heard you. Yeah. And they are going to they're going to terrify you with it, Tim. Uh, well, I, I'm already terrified. Yeah. I don't need to see the movie. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be coming out later this year. But uh, I just thought I'd throw that at you. Uh, you know, I don't know that we we just had a brand new Chucky movie, Cult of Chucky, a year ago or so, maybe two years ago. Are we really in need of a reboot? I, well, at you, this point, I like this spin. I th yeah, I like that spin. I think sure, yeah. You know, am I jumping the gun by uh, by saying? Uh, I, I mean, I know you were you were unfortunately trapped in the desert watching uh, watching the Super Bowl, but did you see the? Um, the teaser for the new Twilight Zone uh, series? I did, yeah. Jordan Peele is going to be in yeah. charge of it, right? Yeah. 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 I did. Um, 
I, I hope it's good, but what confused me was it said streaming exclusively on CBS. So does that mean it's going to be like the Star Trek Discovery series? It won't be on actual TV. You've got to have yes. the CBS streaming service. Yeah, yeah, you have to have CBS <sighs> all access to see it. Yeah. Shenanigans. Yeah. They won't get my money and, and attention, unfortunately. You know, I love Star Trek. I won't even sign up for it for that purpose. I, you know, I'll just wait till it, I guess they release it on DVD and it's done with one season because nobody's watching it. A lot of uh, a lot of access and st- or streaming uh, networks are popping up. You've got Disney's new um, network that's coming to fruition here soon. I think within the next year or so, uh, DC Universe is popping up with some good series. Um, you've got CBS All Access that not only has the Star Trek, uh, the new Star Trek show, but now they're releasing this Twilight Zone show that I, I just from the that little thirty second trailer, I it caught my interest, and now I'm I'm having second thoughts about maybe wanting to get CBS All Access. I, I I'm I'm gonna be I don't know I'm gonna be yeah you should do more, that and then pirate all the episodes for me so that I can watch them at my leisure. I'm going to be working every Wait, single waking sh- moment at the Sugar Shack now. I shouldn't say that on air, should I? No, you shouldn't. It's uh, it's bad. All right, yeah. Tim. Let's uh, let's begin. We're gonna we're gonna take turns reading the news today. Um, as uh, we've had some bad weather, Tim has been a little bit under the weather, and uh, I'm just going to help him out here. So we're going to swap back and forth on some stories. But you have the con number one. Where uh, are we going next? Thank you. Uh, we uh, we go to. Uh, it looks like North Carolina, where uh, a college student thought her apartment had a ghost, but instead she found a man in her closet wearing her clothes. Yes, it sounds like an old Scooby-Doo episode, uh, but... <laughs> it's, Why, it's just Mr. Johnson, the transvestite who lives down the road, <laughs> Scoob. No, he's a transvestite. <laughs> <laughs> a word we never heard in the 70s. Uh, right. A uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro Jr. identified only as Maddie... The local media found a man in her closet in her off-campus apartment on Saturday. The woman said she found the man wearing her clothes and carrying a bag of other items that belonged to her. 30-year-old Andrew Clyde Swoford uh, was arrested and charged with misdemeanor breaking and entering. Maddie and her roommates have no idea how anyone could have entered their apartment when they weren't home. Gee, hmm, I don't know. Once you lock the door, no one ever gets in, right? A uh, University of North Carolina a Greensboro student discovered a man in her closet wearing her clothes on Saturday. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book I never got to read when I was a kid. And she has no idea how he got into her off-campus apartment. The UNCG su- or junior, I almost said senior, which is a senior that's uh, really a junior but wants to be a senior, uh, identified only as Maddie by local media, uh, said she heard a noise coming from her closet around lunchtime on Saturday and found the man inside with a bag of her clothing. 30-year-old Andrew Clyde Swoford uh, was arrested and charged with misdemeanor breaking and entering. Greensboro Police Department spokesman Ron Glenn told the Greensboro News and Record, Maddie told Fox 8 that recently she had noticed pieces of clothing like shirts and pants missing from her closet, and she and her roommates thought that there may have been a ghost in the apartment. But on Saturday, they realized that it was not a ghost at all. I just hear a rattling in my closet. It sounded like a raccoon. This is, this is coming up to my favorite part of the whole story. Okay. Go ahead. So she hears a rattling in the closet. I just hear a rattling in my closet. It sounded like a raccoon in my closet, Maddie told Fox 8. I'm like, who's there? And somebody answers, me. He's like, oh, my name is Drew. I open the door and he's in there wearing all of my clothes, my socks, my shoes, and he has a book bag full of my clothes. Now, am I wrong? Look at him. Does mm-hmm. he not look like, kind of remind you of bald, long, straggly hair, and then it's bald on top of it. You can see he's trying to do the sweep over. Okay, remind remind me of who, because you cut out there for a second. Buffalo Bill. Exactly like Buffalo Bill. Yes, right? Yeah. So you know the voices. Who's in there? Me. <laughs> me. Right. <laughs> me. Would you, you find me sexy? Would you, right? would you oh, dress me? I'd dress people. me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's, cre- and then, oh, it, it gets better. He he has another comment to her that just makes my blood run cold, but go ahead. Okay. So Maddie said she called her boyfriend and wa- awaited help from police. In the meantime, she talked to Swoford to keep him distracted from leaving. He tries on my hat. He goes in the bathroom and looks in the mirror and then is like, you're really pretty. Can I give you a hug? 
She Did said, that just not make your skin crawl? Yeah. She said, but he never touched me. Uh, Maddie said she and her roommates have no idea how Swoford could have gotten into the apartment. She said their doors are always locked and there was no damage to the unit's entrance. Uh, incredibly, this isn't the first time Maddie and her roommate found strangers in their house. I'm thinking it's time to move. Uh, the women said that on December 19th, they found two other men in their living room and had no idea how they got there either. God, someone's passing their key around. Um, an employee from the apartment building's management company, Berkeley Communities, told Fox 8 that after the incident, officials changed the locks but did not file a police report. Berkeley Communities is now investigating Saturday's incident. Swoford is being held in uh, Guilford County Jail on a $26,000 bond. You're kind of pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give, Can I give a you hug? a hug? Oh, you know what's really creepy? My wife does a really good uh, vocalization of that guy. She can she can do Buffalo Bill's voice, and it's very unsettling. Oh, that would be fun in the Especially bedroom. when she comes out yeah. naked and, and says, would you want me? I'd want me. And she does the voice, and it just, uh, you know, I don't know if I should be turned on or terrified or both. I wouldn't be turned on the slightest. I would run. Part of me is scared stiff, that's for sure. I wouldn't get stiff over that either. <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Paranormal investigators were chased from Eloise Psychiatric Hospitals by g -g -g ghosts, Tim. <laughs> Paranormal investigators were chased out of the infamous psychiatric hospital by ghosts, they've claimed. The terrifying incident reportedly happened in the U.S. city of Westland, Michigan, at the Eloise Asylum, made famous by psychological thriller Eloise. Todd Bonner, or Boner, not sure which one, <laughs> co-founder of Detroit Paranormal Expeditions, claimed it wasn't the first time his team had fled the creepy building in terror. He said, we believe the building to be haunted. Almost on a daily basis, strange occurrences happen there, including disembodied voices, shadow figures, footfalls, doors closing, and moving objects. We have had team members leave the building because of fear, and I'm included in that. In the video, the team are exploring a dark hallway in the facility, when out of nowhere, a loud crash is heard behind them. Then, they announce to whoever is listening that they're leaving before seeing a vinyl record has been lifted from a shelf and smashed against the floor. Mr. Bonner, Boner, added <laughs> that one of the group had reported seeing a shadowy figure only moments before the incident. He said Brandy Miller, our team psychic, was doing some electronic voice phenomena work known as... Uh, uh, EVP, Dave, yeah. EVP, oh, good, good, yeah. with a piece of equipment called a geobox. She was with several other investigators. One of them had seen a shadowy figure out of the corner of their eye, so they decided to walk over to the area she had seen it in. In the video that they had, you can see and kind of hear them talking about a black figure and how they thought it was in that area. Then an old vinyl record flew off the shelf, hovered in the air, and slammed to the ground. Started as a poorhouse, Eloise, at its peak, was like a small city with over 10,000 patients. Numerous staff and everything they needed on site. It had its own police force, fire department, bakery, post office, power plant, and trolley system, said Todd. It was a self-contained city. It compromised, or comprised, rather not compromised, but it comprised 78 buildings across 902 acres, much of which has been since sold to uh, developers, flattened and turned into shops, apartments, and more. But with such a spooky reputation to shake... The final few buildings have struggled to attract a buyer, hitting the market for $1.5 million in 2015 before it sold for just $1 last year, Tim. Wow. How did we miss that? I don't know. $1. Wow. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah. All right. Where are we off to next? Well, Dave, I can kind of relate to this guy's struggles here. A, a man says his emotional support alligator helps his depression. I, I too, have a, an emotional support uh, deal that I'd like to talk about here in a minute. Uh, a Pennsylvania man says his emotional support alligator helps him deal with his depression. 65-year-old Joy Henney uh, said he registered his registered su emotional support animal named Wally likes to snuggle and give hugs despite being a five-foot-long alligator. 
It's, it's, it's a little scary, maybe. Uh, the York Haven man said he received approval from his doctor to use Wally as his emotional support animal after not wanting to go on medication for depression. I had Wally, and when I came home and was around him, it was all okay, he said. My doctor knew about Wally and figured it worked, so why not? Wally was rescued from outside Orlando at 14 months old and is still growing, so he'll get a lot longer than 5 feet long. Uh, Henny said Wally could be as long as 16 feet long one day. Go, go Wally. Uh, Henny said Wally eats chicken wings and shares an indoor plastic pond with a smaller rescue alligator named Scrappy. So he's got a friend, Dave. Uh, Wally, who turns four this year, is a big teddy bear, in Henny's words. The cold-blooded reptile likes to rest his snout on Henny's, and he likes to give hugs, he said. The alligator has never bitten anyone and is even afraid of cats, according to Henny. I bet you that doesn't last long. No. No. Uh, Henny acknowledged that Wally is still a dangerous wild animal and could probably tear his arm off, but he says he's never been afraid of him. And his background also indicates a comfort with creatures like Wally. He hosted a show called Joy Henny's Outdoors on ESPN Outdoors from 1989 to 2000. And he is frequently taking Wally out for meet and greets at places like senior centers and minor league baseball games. He's just like a dog, Henny told a woman at a recent outing at a senior center. After the senior stopped screaming, <laughs> he wants to be loved and petted. I too have a, a little bit of difficulty, Dave. Um, I have an emotional support love doll I like to take with me on flights, except for TSA won't let me take it through um, screening yeah. because they're afraid that I might be smuggling something in certain holes. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's unnerving all the way around. Well, I, I get to hug it and, and I get my support my way, um, but people just look at me funny in public. Just saying. Hey, whatever makes your travel plans easier, Tim, if it's inflatable love dolls, I'm not here to judge you much. <laughs> not much. More haunted. More haunted. Ha- haunted, Tim. More haunted. Haunted? Haunted. H A U N T E D. More haunted than the Tower of London. Codner Castle has been voted the top UK paranormal hotspot. Hmm. From the apparition of an injured Scottish crusader who paces the grounds inconsolable with rage to a French gray lady whose echoes can be heard on the wind, Codner Castle boasts its fair share of resident ghouls, Tim. And now its spooky credentials have earned the ruinous medieval fortress along with its 17th century farmhouse the title of 51st most haunted location in the UK, beating out the Tower of London. The 51st most haunted spot, Tim. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. From the apparition of the injured Scottish crusader who paces the grounds and consolable with rage to the French gray lady. And now its spooky credentials have earned this fortress uh, the 51st most haunted location. Rokia Brown, chairman of the Codner Castle Heritage Trust, has been fighting to promote the historic gem for more than a decade, believing that the site's paranormal repertoire, repertoire Tim, repertoire, that word looks weird to say and even weirder to say. Repertoire. Yeah, that's what I said. Repertoire. A repertoire. Repertoire. <laughs> Twai. <laughs> Twai. Could play a major part in its preservation and future. <laughs> I can show you I'm not racist. I can script French words and American words. Oh, good Ghost hunting you. events are flourishing here. And I have to say, visitors are never disappointed with what they find, she said. We also have been featured on TV as part of an investigation with Most Haunted Live. The castle has a phenomenal history and atmosphere. So it's not surprising we're attracting attention from paranormal investigators. I should say not being number 51, Tim. Oh, well, yeah. Rokia herself. Yeah, Rokia herself has had several eerie experiencing experiences at the grade two listed site, most of which have taken place in the 17th century farmhouse, said to be the location of a murder and four suicides. Back when we founded the society, we were cleaning out the farmhouse. The weather was so hot, we decided to go outside for a cup of tea and rest, she said. Suddenly, a stone came hurtling through one of the windows and landed in the garden, even though there was nobody inside. 
Another time, we were cleaning and discovered a copper necklace on the farmhouse floor, surrounded by dismembered peacock butterfly wings. The glass was exactly the same color as the butterfly wings, and it was like it had been laid out as a gift. It was very strange. Visitors say our scariest ghost is the battle-weary squat- squattish. Yes. He's a squattish crusader who <laughs> died of his injuries while taking refuge, Tim, at the castle. I've uh, I've taken refuge many a times, actually. Yes. Yeah. 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 People have seen him stalking the grounds, running through the ruins of the main hall, wearing a dull metal helmet. He has a quite an aggressive presence, it is said, because he never made it back to the homeland he adored. Our great lady has been known to glide wistfully around the grounds. Sometimes you can hear her singing. They come into America. No, no, they didn't. They come into America today. I know he's old, but he didn't sing back then. No, it's a girl. Apparently, she uh, she was a heavily pregnant French woman who tragically died along with her unborn baby after falling off a horse. So she's probably singing more like, Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Domergue, Domergue. I know you're pretty impressed with my grasp of the French language, Tim. It is the language of love. When you delve into its past, you'll discover the castle is of great historical significance as the former home of the medieval England's most powerful family for 300 years, the de Grey family. Well, no wonder there's a Grey lady. They're part of the de Grey family. But up until the mid-2000s, the once bustling castle had fallen out of a living memory, Tim. Rokia said, I grew up in Codner. And I would often look up at the ruins of the castle, all but forgotten, and it would just break my heart. By that time, history had fallen away, and Codner Castle wasn't even recognized as a castle. It was assumed to be a Tudor manor house. How dare they? But after we founded the Codner Castle Preservation Society in 2006, Channel 4's time team carried out archaeological dig and found a drawbridge pit, finally landing us castle status. So if I just put a drawbridge in at my house, Tim, and I my house becomes my castle? Pretty much, yeah. Nice. Now all we want is for Codner Castle to achieve the immortality it deserves. That's all they're asking, Tim. Hmm. Well, that ain't much. Open days are held at the castle on the second Sunday of every month. Please be aware there is no parking and you will need to walk up to the castle. More information can be found on the website www.codnercastle.co.uk. Hmm. And what's up next, Tim? Well, Russia's up to no good again, Dave. It turns Sons out. Sons of bitches. I know. It turns out that they're making a weapon that makes their enemies want to vomit. It turns out, Dave, it's it's uh, it's just Superman 4 on DVD. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. yeah I could do it. Yeah, no, unfortunately, it's uh, it's not a complicated weapon. It's it's just. Similar. Natasha, we turn on machine that makes moose and squirrel very sick. Well, it was either that or Batman and Robin on on uh, iTunes, uh, but uh, they refuse to carry it for very long. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a non lethal weapon that induces hallucinations and vomiting among enemy combatants has been fitted to two Russian warships. By the way, that was my least favorite in the uh, movie series. Non lethal weapon. Non lethal weapon, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, a geriatric Mel Gibson. Yeah, it was just, yeah. uh, it was, it was just, um, <laughs> just okay. That's it was, all. It was just Mel Gibson running up to people saying, "You want to see Passion of the Christ too? Christ comes again." Um, uh, yeah, it was, they are doing. They're they're doing uh, Passion of the Christ too. Yeah, how do you do a sequel? I it's mean, it's about when he when he was buried and he came back. Oh God! Yeah, he never. Resur- came- I think it's called the Passion Two: The Resurrection. <laughs> and it's musical i hear jesus comes out and goes don't call it a comeback i've been here for years and he kind of raps most of the because you know that whole uh yeah. hamilton thing so yeah. hot oh, with oh, rap okay. so yeah the, the, he's yeah. it's going to be like a hip-hop jesus Mel gibson's really trying to get yeah. back into the good graces of I both see. the hip-hop and jewish community so I he's see. going to blend them together into passion to passion the to. hip-hop return of the christ <laughs> Wow. I can, it, uh, I can feel the flames of hell licking at my feet yeah, right now, Tim. So we're all going to burn in hell. It's going to be Jews, Gentiles, uh, anybody else who wants to watch the movie. We're just all going to burn in hell. That'll be fun. 
a uh, non-lethal weapon that induces hallucinations and vomiting among enemy combatants has been fitted to two Russian warships. The 5P-42 f- fill-in, it can fill in for whatever, a futuristic Dazzler-type device. Oh, so they're taking it straight from the X-Men, Dave. It'll be fun. Uh, can cause troops to miss their targets by blinding them, inducing delirious conditions and making them want to be sick. Evidently, uh, they're just now catching up on the Chris Claremont run of X-Men, the tail end of it over in Russia, and they're getting some really weird ideas from it. Two advanced Russian Navy frigates, uh, the Admiral Gorshkov and the Admiral Kazatonov, uh, have been fitted with the fillin, meaning Eagle Owl, the RIA Novosti uh, media agency reported. The device can fire a strobe-like beam that disrupts an opponent's eyesight, hindering their ability to aim a weapon at night. You know, Nikolai Volkov would have told them, just take Mr. Fuji's salt and throw it in their eyes. It's much easier, but nobody ever listened to Nikolai Volkov. That is a WWF reference from the 1980s, brought to you by Tim Dennis. You're welcome. It is also capable of effectively suppressing night vision technology, laser distance sensors, and range-finding systems for anti-tank missiles from as far as five kilometers, according to the manufacturer, Rus Electronics. Uh, The weapons development is included in testing on volunteers who shot assault rifles, sniper rifles, and machine guns at targets that were protected by the fill-in. They all experienced trouble aiming because they were unable to see the target, plus they're male and they were near a toilet, just saying. Exposure to the weapon also affected the volunteers' physical condition. 45% of them reported feeling dizzy, sick, and disoriented. Uh, and 20% of the volunteers are said to have experienced a ball of light moving in front of their eyes. The Admiral Gorshkov and Admiral Kazantov, uh, part of the Russia's northern fleet that patrols the Arctic Ocean, both have two fill-in devices fitted. A further two warships currently being built are also expected to carry the weapon. That's a, that's a horrible device, Tim. It is. Yeah. Truly is. Aim it, and it automatically gives people diarrhea. Uh, it makes you want to vomit. I guess the diarrhea yeah. version would be, uh, I don't know, I, I think they that's sent That's 2.0, some, that's version 2.0. Yeah, they sent something with curry over for you. And they, oh, they just, yeah. wow. Those of you that enjoy curry, please send your hate mail directly to Tim Dennis at TimHatesCurry.com. I'm getting plenty of it lately. Yeah. I, you have uh, been? You've been getting a little heat, have you? I've been getting a little heat in between uh, last week's Supernatural News and evidently this week's True Crime Tuesday. It, it uh phew, People just uh, not like it. Well, you know, we got to keep it controversial. That's how people listen, Tim. Yeah, well, I know. That's why I do the show in the nude. It's controversial. Well, it is, yeah. yeah. Harvard's top astronomer says an alien ship may be among us, and he doesn't care what his colleagues think. He's like the honey badger, Tim. (laughs) Honey badger just don't care. That's right. We're going to Cambridge, Massachusetts, Tim. Before he started the whole alien spaceship thing last year, the chairman of Harvard University's astronomy department was known for public lectures on modesty, personal modesty, which Avi Loeb said that uh, he learned growing up on a farm and what Loeb calls cosmic modesty. The idea that it's arrogant to assume we are alone in this universe or even a particularly special species. You can find a poster for one of those lectures in Loeb's office today, though it's a bit lost among the clutter. Photos of Loeb's pose, uh, Loeb posing under the dome of Harvard's enormous 19th century telescope. Thank you notes from elementary school children. A framed interview he gave to the New York Times in 2014. His books on the formation of galaxies. His face again and again. A bespectacled man in his mid-50s with a perpetually satisfied smile. Loeb stands behind his desk on this first morning of spring. Courses in a uh, creaseless suit, Tim stapling a syllabi for his afternoon class. He points visitors to this and that on the wall. He mentions that four TV crews were in this office on the day in the fall when the spaceship theory went viral, and now five film companies are interested in making a movie about his life. A neatly handwritten page of equations sits on the desk on the edge closest to the guest chairs. Oh, this is just something I did last night, Loeb says offhandedly. It's a calculation, he explains, supporting his theory that an extraterrestrial spacecraft, or at least a piece of one, may at this moment be flying past the orbit of Jupiter. He's a confident man, Tim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since publishing his controversial paper, Loeb 
has run a nearly nonstop media circuit. Embracing the celebrity that comes from being perhaps the most academically distinguished E.T. enthusiast of his time, the top Harvard astronomer who suspects technology from another solar system just showed up at our door. And this, in turn, has left some of his peers nonplussed, grumbling at what they see as flimsy theory or bewildered as to why Harvard's top astronomer just won't shut up about aliens. What you can't call Loeb is a crank. When astronomers in Hawaii stumbled across the first known interstellar object in late 2017, a blip of light moving so fast past the sun that it could have only come from another star, Loeb had three decades of Ivy League professorship and hundreds of astronomical publications on his resume, mostly to do with the nature of black holes and early galaxies and other subjects far from any tabloid shelf, Tim. So when seemingly every astronomer on the planet was trying to figure out how the interstellar object, dubbed the Oumuamua, which is Hawaiian for scout, Tim. Oumuamua. It's, it's, uh, it makes me giggle. I can't lie. Yeah. yeah. While every other astronomer on the planet was trying to figure out how the interstellar object named Oumuamua got to our remote patch of Milky Way, Loeb's extraordinarily confident suggestion that it probably came from another civilization, could not be easily dismissed. Considering an artificial origin, one possibility is that Oumuamua, pronounced Oumuamua, <laughs> as it says in the article, is a light sail floating in interstellar space as debris from an advanced technological piece of equipment. Loeb wrote out with his colleagues, Shamul Bailey in Astrophysical Let uh, Journal Letters in November, thrilling ET enthusiasts and upsetting the fragile orbits of space academia, Tim. Oumuamua is not not an alien spaceship, and the authors of the paper insult honest scientific inquiry to even suggest it, tweeted Paul M. Sutter, an astrophysicist at Ohio State University, shortly after the paper was published. A shocking example of sensationalist, ill-motivated science, theoretical astrophysicist Ethan Siegel wrote in Forbes. Snobby dicks. That's what I say, Tim. Both of them are snobby dicks. <laughs> snobby North Carolina dicks. State University astrophysicist Katie Mack suggested to The Verge that Loeb was engaging in a common practice in which an astrophysicist poses a theory that they may not believe. Sometimes you write a paper about something that you don't believe to be true at all just for the purpose of putting it out there, she told the publication. Most scientists besides Loeb assume that Oumuamua is some sort of rock be it an asteroid ejected from some star and meltdown hundreds of millions of years ago, or an icy comet wandering the interstellar void. But it's moving too fast for an inert rock, Loeb points out, zooming away from the sun as if something is pushing it from behind. And if it's a comet spewing jets of stream, the limited observations astronomers made of it showed no sign. Loeb argues that Oumuamua's behavior <laughs> means... It can be, as is commonly imagined. I just want to keep saying it that way. So anytime anybody sees that word, all they'll hear is, oh, more, more. Well, as you keep that saying it that story. way, I keep wondering if I need to send an ambulance out there because it sounds <laughs> like something's about to explode in your head. <laughs> Loeb argues that Oumuamua's behavior means it can't be, as is commonly imagined, a clump of rock shaped like a long potato, but rather an object that's very long and no more than one millimeter thick. Perhaps like a kilometer long obloid pancake or a ship sail, so light and thin that sunlight, uh, so so light and thin that sunlight is pushing it out of our solar system. I don't know what that means. Uh, oh, oh, they needed a comma in there, Tim. So ah. so light and thin, comma that sunlight is pushing it out of our solar system. And while he's not say, saying it's definitely aliens, he is saying we can't think of any other thing, anything other than aliens that fits the data. And he's saying that all over the international news. This guy's mooing all over the place, Tim. Yeah, yeah, he is. Many people expected once there would be pu his, this publicity, I would back down, Loeb says. If someone shows me evidence to the contrary, I will immediately back down. That's a pretty good stance to take. In a matter of months, Loeb has become a one-man alternative to the dirge of terrestrial news. It changes your perception on reality, just knowing that we're not alone, he says. We are fighting on borders, on resources. It would make us feel part of a planet Earth as a civilization rather than an individual country's voting on Brexit. So now he is famous, styling himself as a truth teller and risk taker in an age of overly conservative Quiet, quiescent, 
scientists, Tim. Ah, yes. Quiet, quiescent. Quiescent, oh. yes. Yeah. Big word. Mm -hmm. The mainstream approach is you sort of drink your coffee in the morning and expect that you'll find it later on. It's a stable lifestyle, but for me, it resembles more of the lifestyle of a business person rather than scientists, he says. The worst thing that can happen to me is if is I would be relieved of my administrative duties, and that would give me even more time to focus on science, Loeb said. Oh, now he's taunting him, Tim. Ooh. Go ahead, relieve me. I'll just work more on science. All the titles I have, I can dial them back. In fact, I can dial myself back to the farm, he says. Dag. Wow. Oh, he's throwing it down, son. Yeah. Throwing it down. He grew up in an Israeli farming village. And he would sit in the hills and read philosophy books, imagining the broader universe. He says a fascination that led him into academia and all the way to Oumuamua. Are you all right there? Did you? <laughs> I'm just saying that's what brought him to Oumuamua. Sounded like it. So I just something. love that he's like, hey, this is what it is. And if you if you don't believe it, prove me wrong. That's a pretty ballsy move. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. If he's mastered the national news interview by now, his lecture begins a bit stilted. He looks down at the table as he speaks. He asks the freshmen of the most prestigious universities to go around the table and list their hobbies. Ten minutes later, Loeb goes off script. Hey, did anyone hear the name Oumuamua? He asked. <laughs> what did it mean? Almost everyone nods. And freshman Matt Jacobson, who came to Harvard from an Iowa farm town, volunteers quietly. There was speculation that it was from another civilization. Who made that speculation, Loeb asks, smiling. There's an awkward silence in the room, and then Jacob cries, Was it you? Oh, my gosh. And the professor smiles wider. So the professor is kind of becoming um, Walter White. <laughs> Say my name. Say my name. He's insisting upon it, Tim. Hmm. <laughs> All right, where are we off to next? Evidently not Omumu. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be stuck in my head now. Uh, hey, I'm a, I'm a. I, a new business in Texas is insisting on filling your veins with young blood to fight aging, and we're not talking theoretically; we're talking literally. What? Yeah, it might be the most controversial new startup in the nation. Ambrosia will fill you, and not we're not talking the '80s band, the soft rock band. But Ambrosia will fill your veins with the blood of young people for only $8,000 in an effort to combat aging. The service is now available in eight U.S. cities, including one in Texas, because all those flexus blood letters live in Texas. Uh, some are calling the procedure an anti-aging miracle. Others can't help but see it as a little bit creepy and not unlike something out of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Could young blood be the secret to eternal youth, or at least a legitimate anti-aging strategy? And if the answer is yes, what moral, responsi moral responsibility does it, such a procedure demand? I'm just creeped out by the whole thing. In 2016, a Stanford Medical School graduate named Jesse Carmazin uh, set out to find his dream company. Now Ambrosia is making headlines. The business accepts blood from youthful donors and fills the veins of older people with it in the belief that this will fight aging through rejuvenation of the patient's organs. The company is now accepting payment for the treatment through PayPal. One liter of blood for $8,000, two liters for $12,000. Well, that's a bargain. You get like a 33% off deal. Give me a little background music while you tell the rest of the story, Tim. I was going to say, that's very spry, chipper, and now. <laughs> Init Initial plans had been to open the first Ambrosia Clinic in uh, New York. However, those plans changed. The cities uh, where Ambrosia currently offers the procedure are now Los Angeles, San Francisco, Tampa, Omaha, and the Lone Star State of Houston. Uh, the idea that young blood can have a restorative power on the old is nothing new. 
Uh, some might even argue that the legends of vampires of the horrific practices of the Hungarian noblewoman Elizabeth Bathory were inspired by such a belief. However, the idea has long since left the realm of superstition and entered the sphere of science. Studies dating back to the 1950s have found that parabiosis, the surgical conjoining of the circulatory system of lab mice, resulted in the blood of younger mice seeming to have a rejuvenating influence on the older mice. More recently, researchers at Stanford University School of Medicine have conducted tests that infused human plaza, uh, plasma from the umbilical cords of newborn human babies into the veins of old mice. The tests appear to have confirmed that human blood plasma can have apparent positive effects on memory and learning ability in old lab mice. There you go. So well, there you there's, go, Dave. There's the takeaway. Yeah, it, uh, it, it simply just takes killing the young people and taking their blood. So you got a whole blood bank right there in your, your, uh, your roof. Hmm, something to think about. Yeah. Another thing to think about is our friends at Psychic Source. They actually have psychic advisors who work with the police to help solve crimes. These people don't mess around. No wonder they've been the most respected psychic service since the 80s. That's just as old as the TV show about a cat-eating puppet named Elf Tim. Ah. Uh-huh. Psychic Source's experienced psychic advisors are available 24-7 for private, confidential readings via phone, online chat, or face-to-face video readings. 100% satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Take a chance. Who knows? It could change your life. Not sure where to get started? They have a 24-7 customer care agent to match you personally with one of their gifted psychics. Ready to give them a shot? Your first three minutes are free, plus it's only 83 cents a minute for a reading up to 30 minutes. Just mention promo code DARKNESS when you call 1-800-355-9214. That's 1-800-355-9214 or sign up online at PsychicSource.com. PsychicSource.com and mention promo code DARKNESS. To get those first three minutes free and only 83 cents a minute for a reading up to 30 minutes long. That's a hell of a steal deal, Tim. Yeah, it is. A hell of a steal deal? Yes, a steal deal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And a, a deal still. Yes. Yeah. 60 seconds. That's exactly how long this commercial lasts. You know what else you can do in about a minute? Get an offer for your car with True Car. That's right. In about the time it takes to floss your teeth, pet your dog, do a few sit ups, or just listen. To my voice, you could get a true cash offer. Best of all, you can do it from your smartphone or home. Just go to True Car and simply enter your license plate number and watch how your car's details pop up. Answer a few more questions and you'll get that accurate true cash offer from a local True Car certified dealer. It's just that easy. After that, you bring your car in. They're going to check it out with you together. You can ask questions and get the answers you need. So there's never any surprises. Then simply leave with your check or trade in your car for a new ride. So when you're ready to experience a better way to sell or trade in your car, check out True Car today. All right, Tim, where are we off to next? I don't believe I have any more stories left. You you have no more stories left? No. Well, I do, Tim. I have one final story then. Okay. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. The question asked by Neil Dagnall and Ken Drinkwater is, why do a quarter of Americans believe in psychic powers? Mm. Mind reading and the ability to predict the future are not skills people generally associate with the human race, yet research shows many people genuinely believe in the existence of psychic powers. You would think that instances of proven psychic fraud over the years would weaken the credibility of psychic claims. There have been historic cases such as Alajos Pop, the Hungarian spiritualist medium, who was found to be faking animal appearances at seances, and then more recently self-described psychic James Heydrich was revealed as a trickster. Heydrich confessed his paranormal demonstrations were tricks that he learned in prison. Another notable example involved televangelist Peter Popoff. He, his uh, wife used a wireless transmitter to broadcast information about sermon attendees to pop off via an earpiece. Popoff claimed to receive his information by paranormal means and rose to fame, hosting a nationally televised program during which he performed seemingly miraculous cures on audience members. But despite such cases, 
There are still many people who firmly believe in the power of psychic ability, according to a U.S. Gallup survey. For example, more than one quarter of people believe humans have psychic abilities, such as telepathy and clairvoyance. A recent report may help to shed some light on why people believe to or continue to believe rather in psychic powers. The study tested believers and skeptics alike with the same level of education and academic performance and found that people who believe in psychic powers think less analytically. This means that they tend to interpret the world from a subjective personal perspective and fail to consider information critically. Believers also often view psychic claims as Uh, confirmatory evidence, regardless of their evidential basis. The case of Chris Robinson, who refers to himself as a dream detective, demonstrates this. Robinson claims to have foreseen terrorist attacks, disasters, and celebrity deaths. His assertions derive from the limited and questionable evidence. Tests conducted by Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona provided support for Robinson's ability. However, other researchers using similar methods failed to confirm Schwartz's conclusion. Psychic claims are uh, often general and vague, such as fortune telling, a uh, plane crash, or celebrity death. And this is in part why so many people believe in the possibility of psychic abilities. This is known as the Barnum effect, a common psychological phenomenon whereby people tend to accept vague general personality descriptions as uniquely applicable to themselves. Research, for example, has shown that individuals give high accuracy readings to descriptions of their personality that supposedly are tailored specifically to them, that are in fact vague and general enough to apply to a wide variety of people. The name references the circus man Phineas Taylor Barnum who had a reputation as a master psychological manipulator. Many psychic claims have also proved impossible to confirm. A classic illustration is Uri Geller's contention that he willed the football to move during a penalty kick at Euro 96. The ball movement occurred spontaneously in an uncontrolled environment, and Geller made the claim retrospectively. When professed, Uh, Abilities are subject to scientific scrutiny. Researchers generally discredit them. This was true of Derek Ogilvie in the 2007 TV documentary, The Million Dollar Mind Reader. Investigation concluded that Ogilvie's genuinely believed he possessed powers, but was not actually able to read babies' minds. And when scientists have endorsed psychic claims, criticism has followed. This occurred in the 1970s when physicists Russell Targ and Harold Puthoff published a paper in the prestigious Journal of Nature, which supported the notion that Uri Geller possessed genuine psychic ability. Psychologists such as Ray Hyman refuted this, highlighting major methodological, oh my God, Tim, methodological, (laughs) why does that word not want to come out of my mouth, Tim? Mythological? No, methodological flaws. Oh, method. Method, methodologic, methodological? Yeah, right. It's a methodological because it's method, a logical, huh. methodological okay. flaws. So these include a hole in the laboratory wall that afforded views of drawings that Geller physically reproduced. Another factor that facilitates belief in psychic ability is the existence of scientific research that provides positive findings. This reinforces believers' views that claims are genuine and phenomenon real, but ignores the fact that published studies are often criticized and replication is necessary in order for general acceptance to occur. One prominent example of this was a paper produced by the social psychologist Daryl Byrne in the High Quality Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. It was said the research showed support for the existence of precognition, conscious cognitive awareness, and premonition, effective apprehension of a future event. But other researchers failed to pre- reproduce those uh, same results. So it seems that despite occurrences of fakery, forgery, and fraudulence, as well as mixed evidence, people will still continue to believe in psychic phenomena. Indeed, research has shown that one in three Americans feel they have experienced a psychic moment, and nearly half of all U.S. women claim they have felt the presence of a spirit. Whether this is down to lack of analytical skill, genuine experiences, or just in a bid to make the world a little bit more interesting, it seems believers will continue to believe, despite science indicating otherwise. I think they're a little bit more on the... He sounds more cynical to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to put that out there. I could be wrong. Let's uh, let's take a break. When we come back, it's time for you to shine. We've got your stories next on Parashare. The hit podcast based on the Emmy-nominated A&E series Cold Case Files is back with new episodes on Podcast One. 
Listen to powerful stories of crimes almost forgotten by the passage of time with interviews of the people involved as investigators shine a new light on these cases and bring those responsible to justice. Download new episodes of Cold Case Files every Tuesday on Podcast One or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Beyond the Darkness We're back, and you're tuned into the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. I'm Dave Schrader. This is Beyond the Darkness. That is Tim Dennis. And this is our phone number, 651-300-4977. Our voices from Beyond Voicemail. You can call us and share your paranormal encounters, and we'd love to hear your lovely tones coming over our airwaves, sharing your real-life strange stories. You get up to three minutes to record your encounter, and if it goes longer than three minutes, just hang up and call right back and continue telling your story. Tim will do his best to put them all together in the correct order, and we will play it as one full narrative, just like this caller did. This is Sean Stoffel. I'm from Elizabeth, Indiana, and I'm currently living in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And I had a recent close encounter. Whenever I got incarcerated for a DUI back in 2010, I had to do about um, a year and a half incarceration because I had quite a bit of a drinking problem back in the day in my early 20s. This fourth DUI sent me to a uh, prison, and um, I was at RDC, uh, the main holding facility before they classify you and send you to your prison classification. Um, since it was just I was a DUI offender, I was classified as a level one slash level two um, DLC holding facility, and. I was at the old boys' school that is in Plainfield, Indiana. They reformed that old boys' school where Axel Rose was at, Charles Manson was at. These were facts. And um, there were stories from some of the other inmates uh, that told me there, and once I arrived there to finish out my sentence, that uh, said that a bunch of children used to be here, and a lot of them died. A lot of them died from food poisoning, or there was supposedly a big fire in some of the housing facilities that are that are um, on site there. And even some people would say that they would see shadowy figures in some of the abandoned buildings out, out of, or looking out the windows. Now, me understanding of how the age is these days, there's a lot of young people out there on drugs, so they could be hallucinating or just seeing stuff because their minds may have been messed up over the time of, you know, and hurting their bodies with these substances. So, me as a, uh, um, not really somebody who believes in ghosts or the supernatural because I gotta believe it to see it. I'm that type of guy. And it's nice to be able to have an imagination. But, I had about two weeks left before I was leaving one of those dorms. And I listened to Coast to Coast Radio, actually, at that time. I just started listening to that. I never heard of Darkness Radio, and this was in 2011. And um, I, was, I was sound asleep, and then I heard this bang, 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 real loud, like someone's fist was slamming down on the metal bar that was above my head, and I was on the bottom bunk. And if anybody's going to do that, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to whip their ass. You know, I'm going to thump them. Don't do that to people, especially when they're locked up. That's, you know, that's provoking somebody. You don't mess with people like that. And uh, so I, I woke up. I immediately sprang up and woke up, and I seen a figure. And it was, I, my eyes did not play tricks on me. It doesn't do that. And, um, you know, um, I was... I've been sober for about a year and a half, so I was clear-minded. Um, and I seen a figure. It was like wearing clothes in a sense. So I, it went and it ran off, and I had like a little blanket set up to block the light out. And it moved the blanket as it moved. And I immediately jumped up. Like I was probably three feet behind this thing after it went around the corner. And I was going to grab all of it and whip its ass. I was going to slam it. You know, you don't just do that to people. Well, as soon as I turn around that corner, I look out, and everybody's asleep. 
everybody. I look up, I look around. You can vaguely see throughout the Bay Area of 60 bunks. There was about three aisles. Nobody was in sight. And I went down about four or three bunks, three or four bunks down where these two guys are always up in the middle of the night that read the Bible where the light hits it good. And I went up to them. I said, where'd he go? Where'd he go? And they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. They were just so like confused, like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? So I went and I ran to the bathroom. That's the only place anybody could hide. No one was in there. And I walked around and I went and I went and I nudged somebody who fit the profile. He was slobbering out of sleep. It was 3.41 in the morning. I went back to my bunk and I sat down and I had the hair stand up on the my back of my neck and arms for the first time in my life fully realized exactly what it was. And it was a ghost, an apparition, apparition, um, however you say it, um, spirit. It was one of those boys that died back in the late 1800s. And that is my paranormal experience, and I will take that to my grave. Thank you. Hi, this is Sean again. I would like for you all to have a lot more information just than based what I was just coming off from my memory. And I got to sit down and think about it. Part of my job was I was a level one classification for DUI, um, so I really wasn't uh, in there for you know, any bad charges or nothing. So I had a job, and my job was able to weed eat and mow grass inside and outside the perimeters of the uh, prison slash old boy school, whatever. Um, and I would have to – I remember going to, like, there was a little cemetery, um, maybe probably about – I don't know, 100 headstones. They were all from the late 1800s. And it would show, I, I do remember it would show like, um, who, who was ever this kid? I don't remember like the names of these kids, but they were kids because they were born 1885 to 1895. Um, they were like, you know, anywhere between six and 14 years old. There was lots of these little headstones and, and I heard rumors about this before I ever went out there to do it, and there were people telling me about this place. I'm like, yeah, whatever, you're all full of crap, you know. Until I was like, man, well, there really is a little cemetery here, and and um, it's actually called the Stop Facility now. And the reason it's called the Stop Facility now is called for Short Term Offenders Program. So if you have less than a year on your sentence left to do, then you go through this program, and it gives you a three month time cut to be able to get out early on your time based on good behavior and all that. I had like uh, eight months left on my sentence. I did 10 years or 10 months hard time before I got my plea, and then I went straight to the stop facility and finished my time there and um, got my time cut or whatnot. But um, that that place, it, 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 it's legit. It's for real. In Plainfield, Indiana, in Plainfield, Indiana you can look it up. Um, I wish I had the information on me right now to be able to tell you, but um, this is very, very true and very honest. I'm a very skeptical person. I do not believe in a lot of things, you know, but this this is for real, and I'm not psychotic or anything like that. This, this was a very true event that happened, and there was a ghost or a spirit or whatever it was that did uh, bang on my bunk and chose me out of the 66 other people that were within that dorm in uh, one of those old buildings that I was at. And uh, that's exactly what it was. But I have more stories. Thank you very much. Bye. Remember, aside from calling us at 651-300-4977, at 651-300-4977, you can also email your stories to me at dave at darknessradio.com. Just like this person did. Dear Dave and Tim, my wife Shelly and I have been huge fans of you two since discovering the show shortly after meeting Dave way back at the second Michigan Paranormal Convention in 2010. As a couple of self-described weirdness magnets, we both have had all sorts of odd goings on around us. My wife, a bigger weirdness magnet than me, had paranormal experiences starting at the age of five when her parents had friends over to play with a Ouija board and continued all the way into adulthood. Then, in 1993, she had an experience that shaped her life from that moment forward. She had an experience where she met God. Remarkably, he doesn't quite look like you would imagine. At the urging of myself and some friends, she began to write all of her experiences into notebooks to eventually be turned into a book. 
but more than anything, to get out of the word, uh, her world, her God experience. She felt it was her duty to share it with the world, even if she was worried that people would think she was crazy or that someone in the government would come to interrogate her to see what was shown. We all told her that she had to get that message and all of her experiences out to the real world. For a little over a year, she worked at writing down all of her experiences into a set of notebooks, which she planned to someday type and turn into a book. On the day after Labor Day of 2016, she went in for an MRI in her lower back to see why she was in constant pain. They called us both into the doctor's office to tell her, we have some bad news. You have three herniated discs in your lower back. We also have some terrible news. We spotted what looks like cancer in your spine up between your shoulder blades. A biopsy followed where they discovered that the cancer originated from her lungs. She was stage four. And then radiation, then chemo. She fought like hell, making it through pneumonia and becoming septic twice from the chemo. Then on October 25th, 2018, while in home hospice with our son and myself at her side, she decided that she had had enough of the fight and she went home. What follows is her experience as it was written in one of her notebooks. Parts of it were read by a good friend at her funeral on Halloween last year, which was very fitting because she loved Halloween. You'll have to forgive any punctuation or grammatical errors, but I just couldn't change anything from what she had written in her notes. Shelley's experience. This is the story of the experience that changed my life and set me on a path which led me to become a hypnotherapist and a Reiki healer. Up until now, I've been a little apprehensive to tell somebody because I really didn't think anyone would believe me or think I was crazy. I know that it happened. I just want to set the scene first so you know where I was and what was really going on. My story starts with me going in for minor surgery, laser surgery back in 1993. I had a few bumps I needed to have removed. The surgery should have lasted all of 15 minutes. We had different lasers back then, not the good ones with better technology like we have today. I had to have anesthetic when it was fully knocked out. I just want to add, my doctor had delivered two of my children, so I trusted him very much. I went in for surgery in the morning, and it was early and dark outside. When I got done, it was still dark. Mind you, it was September, so I just thought it was still morning. It was a little while before I even realized I was in surgery for somewhere around 10 hours. I had 30 bumps ranging from the size of a dime to the size of my fist. The pain was like someone threw hot coals on my lap where they just sat there for a while and then threw them on my backside. I was sick from the anesthetic and they were trying to make me leave the hospital. I was burned over a large percentage of my body below my waist and didn't know why. And I wasn't getting any answers. They gave me some scrub pants and made me leave. I was in and out of emergency for the next couple of weeks and I finally convinced them to admit me. I was miserable. I was in so much pain I couldn't eat, sleep, or sit, or think for that matter. I had just had our beautiful son, Sebastian. I was just horrified that I couldn't take care of him and was missing him so much. My mom didn't come to the hospital and see me because she couldn't stand my son's father and would hate the thought of running into him. She didn't want me to tell my dad for fear that he would kill the doctor. And considering he was abusive to me as a young child and never really cared much for me, I didn't see the point. Sebastian's father didn't even visit because he was having too good a time with his friends. So there I was alone, abandoned by my family and friends. My burns were deeply infected and I was in tremendous pain. I just wanted to die. I couldn't take it anymore and I began to cry. I rolled over on my side in the hospital bed and asked God to take care of me. I didn't want to live anymore. I felt like nobody cared about me. All I could do is cry. Please, God, take me. All of a sudden, three of what I could call rectangular glass cases of stars came twirling over my head, one of them from over the back of my head, one from the east, one from the west. I was opening and closing my eyes, and I still saw the same thing. I remember thinking about how it reminded me of the obelisks from the movie 2001 Space Odyssey when they then they crashed in front of me and bang! I was in what seemed to be a holographic universe. The best way I can describe it now is that I was like standing on the holodeck of Star Trek, where there was nothing but stars all around me. Standing there in the universe, I wasn't feeling any pain. Quite the contrary. In fact, I was feeling this overwhelming feeling of love. Oh, it was glorious. Suddenly, I found myself in what I can only describe as being in nothingness. I felt as though I was hanging in midair. 
like empty space, no stars, no anything. At that same time, I felt that God was checking to see what facet of the greater whole that I was, who I was and where I came from. After my inspection, I found myself feeling as though I was standing at the edge of the universe on my tiptoes, looking at a gigantic galaxy. The center was round and bright and full of stars. Around the brilliant center was a band of stars going clockwise, and then around that was another band of stars going counterclockwise. I said, it's beautiful. I was in awe and having this tremendous feeling of love. This truly had to be heaven. I was seeing God. Then, in an instant, I was back into stars. They were all around me, and I saw N equals Y flash in front of me, hanging in space and made of light. I understand this was to tell me that everything was equal to everything. Nobody or nothing was better than anybody or anything. That everything is equal, I said, I understand. Then I saw the symbol for pi, then E equals MC squared, then a trail of dots. I felt from all that uh, I felt from all of this that it meant don't worry you have many lifetimes and they go by very quick. Then a whole lot of symbols started coming at me, first slow and then started coming at me faster and faster. My soul understood each and every one of them. Next planets sent me love in the form of symbols. They have consciousness. I marveled at the thought all the planets were alive and wanted to be my friend. They were trying to show me that I wasn't alone that I wasn't friendless. Going through this experience, I still wasn't feeling any pain. I pretty much had forgotten about that by now. The next thing I remember is that I was flying very fast with multicolored light above and below me. In my mind, I was being told that there's a group of good beings, a galactic brotherhood somewhere out there. And I was shown an image of thousands of Borg type creatures, all in a type of stasis, which startled and frightened me. Something led me to believe that maybe the government had them in a facility somewhere. It made me afraid that there would be some sort of hostile takeover at some point. I don't know if this was a prediction for the future or not, but it was something that I was shown. Maybe a a warning about transhumanism? I suddenly stopped at a golden spiral staircase that seemed to be moving up and down at the same time, like a spring that was compressing and stretching. Each stair had a symbol in it. And was very beautiful. It reminded me of DNA. But I was feeling that I didn't understand what it meant. Everything up to this point I understood, and I felt like I should know this too, but I just couldn't understand. Then all of a sudden, it was gone. Everything was gone. As fast as everything happened, it stopped. Suddenly, I was back into my hospital bed and back into horrible pain. I was thinking, wait, I thought I was dead. Did I, did I do something wrong? Did God reject me? Was I thrown out because I didn't understand? I was devastated to be back in my bed, back in pain and feeling rejected. Did God abandon me too? I tried to take all this in. Why did this happen? Why me? What did this all mean? It took some time before I realized I wasn't rejected or abandoned by God. I was given a gift and sent back to share that gift with others. I wanted to tell everyone, God loves you. Don't worry, no matter what God loves you, and he is always there. I called my son's father and told him what happened. I was so full of joy. I saw God and God loves you, I had said to him. He just kept changing the subject and trying to start a fight with me like he always did. We hung up. I called my mom. I started telling her what happened. She kept interrupting me about eating potato chips and talking to my sister. I'm telling her, Mom, I just saw God and he wants me to tell you that he loves you and that you're not even paying attention to me. I realized I was talking to myself, so I hung up. I laid in my hospital bed realizing they don't care. How could they not care? Shortly after my experience, I talked to a lawyer and he advised me to go to a burn care center. Beaumont Hospital in Detroit took such great care of me and saved my life. Eventually, I went home to take care of my son and got away from his father. My life has been changed so much in so many ways since my experience. First, I've noticed people come into my life at the right time, just when I need them. Whether it's someone to talk to when I need encouragement or recommend a book that I need to read to understand my life. I learned about healing energy when I was younger, and now I'm a Reiki master. When someone wants a healing or when they when someone wants to learn, I'm more than happy to help. What it all meant, what was downloaded into me, I'm still trying to do this day. 
I do know in my heart that God exists and I'm not afraid to die. Everybody is a facet of God. We're all loved unconditionally and we're never alone. Shelley did eventually heal and managed to have a great life in her 54 years that she was allowed. Like she said, she became a Reiki master, a certified hypnotherapist, and also an angel therapy practitioner, an angel card reader. Towards the end of her life, for some unknown reason, the majority of her clients were women who had been victims of sexual assault who had come to her for help with the PTSD caused by the trauma they'd suffered. She volunteered her time and skills to make money for shelters for battered women and helped at walks of autism awareness. She would always take part of whatever money she made and either donate it to a charity or would give a very big tip to the waitress when we would go out to dinner to help them out and to pay it forward in the hopes they would then in turn do the same. She met God and then described to be an angel and then decided to become an angel on earth. If you decide to share this on air, then I thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping to fulfill my wife's mission in this world. And I know she would have loved Hearing you read it. Sorry, that got to me a little. Uh, It's understandable. It's very powerful. It's a very powerful story. And thank you for sharing it with us and allowing us to share it. And I'm glad that she would have enjoyed us reading that story here. He goes on to say, I'm sorry it's such a long email. But I had to share the whole story. I'm glad. So as I go through her notebooks, I will try to share some of her other stories she had written down of ghosts, demons, a shape-shifting douche nozzle boyfriend, (laughs) UFOs, an invisible something or others. Thank you again, Brian and Shelly. Thank you for sharing that story with us, Brian. And thank you for putting it down, Shelly. Wow, very powerful. Yeah. Good evening, Dave and Tim. As always, great shows as of late. You don't realize it, but you've been with me through the loss of my mother and a host of other health issues, including reoccurring cancer. Your show provides me tremendous comfort and something to look forward to. I never married and I live alone. Sharing my supernatural events with you and the audience is like a therapy to me. I've tried to discuss it with non-believers and I get labeled and shunned. I've shared some of the strange events I've dealt with at the hands of my sister, I believe, and attribute some of this misfortune to her directly. I have a pair of share included. And I thank you for reading it sincerely. And this comes from Mark. I'd like to share additional happenings now with you and my army of darkness friends. I feel like the majority of my life has been one big episode of the Twilight Zone. And sharing my experiences help. Since the last time I contacted you, things have gotten worse. As you may recall, I have a sister, Nancy. We call her Smeagol. She has been heavily involved in the occult for 40 years. She's quite proud of her self-proclaimed powers and membership in a witch's coven in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. Whenever Smeagol is in Belltown Siegel area of Pennsylvania, my house is plagued by paranormal activity, large black flies, and a horrific stench like that of rotted flesh and fecal matter mixed with the odor of an elderly person with a glandular disorder. As I shared in the parish here, I've had multiple professional extermination and cleansing companies fail to resolve this issue. They see the flies and smell the odor, but cannot explain or resolve it. The exterminator commented that he'd never seen flies like this. He doesn't understand where they came from and why, what they were eating and noted other oddities. One of the commercial cleaners with 17 years of experience became so ill by the stench that he couldn't carry the equipment into the house. The company had to send another crew out with two other workers. One of them worked with units to clean after human deaths and severe accidents in vehicles or homes, and he stated he'd never encountered anything even quite like this. I haven't seen or talked to Smeagol since the passing of my mother years ago. That event ended poorly due to her actions at the funeral. When the stench and flies started again, I had a feeling she was back in my area. I began going for long car rides to get out of the house, and on maybe the third or fourth day of this, I started to see really strange and disturbing signs. Belltown is a very remote area of northwestern Pennsylvania and has lots of forest and wildlife. Roadkill is a common sight. I started to notice roadkill near my home that would have a helium balloon with a smiley face tied to a paw or a tail. My name was drawn inside a circled pentagram beside the carcass with sidewalk chalk. I know this sounds ridiculous. The state police laughed too. I assure you, if this is happening to you, it is very far from funny. Smeagol and I have a mutual friend, Marsha. I shared in my initial parish share that Marsha was the young woman who I had driven into town after she told my mother 
and I that Smeagol was adding cremated ashes to my family's Sunday pasta sauces and doing rituals causing orbs to appear. Marsha was at one time involved in the new Kensington Witches' Coven and was very familiar with their rituals and powers. Marsha called me to warn me that Smeagol was in Belltown, staying at a small rundown camp. Smeagol prefers to stay off the grid and this little camp away from any main road and fairly hidden. But I managed to find it. Before reaching the door, I saw the same flies and smelled the same stench that was at my house. I was highly upset. I didn't even knock. I burst through the door looking at her. All the windows were blocked off with blankets, and it was dark inside. I saw no initial signs of her, but I heard scurrying coming from the back room. I got there in time to see Smeagol crawling out of a five-by-five wooden box. As she got to her feet, I noticed her eyes, normally blue, were now in full dilation and black. I've never seen anything like that aside from a horror movie. I exploded about her roadkill antics, and she made a deep, forced laugh with her toothless grin. I also demanded an explanation about the stench of flies. I told her, and I knew she had something to do with it, as this only happens when she's around. In an extremely deep, raspy voice, she said something cryptic like, I'm just getting started, and then cackled uncontrollably. I felt like she was trying to provoke me, so I left before losing control. I pulled off a nearby watering hole called the Halton Hilton for a stiff drink. I talked to my longtime friend, John Handley, the owner, and he shared the Smeagol and her friends had stopped by for some basic supplies about a week prior. They wanted to barter as they had no money. Basically, he felt badly and obliged trading food for a small decorative cube box they offered. John certainly didn't have a need for it. He said he was just happy to help. Later that evening, I had a call from Marsha, and she divulged that Smeagol was into some extremely dark activity, like incantations of demonic spirits, blood rituals, possible animal sacrifices, Ouija boards, and other practices. I firmly believe that in Paranormal, as I shared with you previously, I have experienced strange orbs in our field that seem to have been associated with Smeagol's rituals, with cremated ashes. Hearing that she was into new occult practices was unnerving, to say the least. I was still upset by the customized roadkill artwork and also fearful of what was next. The next morning, I called Marsha to let her know I'd be I'd be away for a while. I wasn't sure where I was headed or for how long. I just knew I needed to get away. I packed and I hit the road. I'm retired, so I leave this luxury or so I have this luxury. I headed to the Atlantic shore without a reservation or a concrete plan. I found a decent little motel and a condo and booked it for two weeks. Smeagol is a drifter, and I had hoped when I returned she'd be gone back to New Kensington, Cleveland, or anywhere but the Belltown area. I felt fantastic while I was away. I was sleeping well, eating well, no flies, no stench, and this was good. The only negative was a minor incident where I needed a bit of assistance from a lifeguard getting back in from a swim after a fairly strong riptide was pulling me out too far. When I returned, things escalated exponentially. I had anxiety like the seven-hour drive home. I just didn't feel right. I could feel my heart beating hard, sweating. My mind was clouded with kind of felt like there was a pressure in it and that it was hollow. That's the best I could describe this. When I turned into the driveway, I had a shooting pain in my back upper hip. When I stood up, my entire right leg was immobilized from pain and literally locked. I have no clue how long I stood there leaning on the open car door trying to move. It was excruciating. I finally had to fall over and roll and crawl to the house, the whole while realizing the stench and the flies were present. Within 10 minutes, my phone was ringing and I managed to roll and crawl to answer it. It was my neighbor in a state of panic who saw me drive by. She was extremely concerned and said Smeagol stopped at her house the day prior and was happily and joyfully saying I had been in an accident and drowned. I told no one where I was going, and no, and certainly no one would have known about the incident with the lifeguard. I called Marsha to let her know I was back, and she told me Smeagol had been saying she was spying on me through astral projection. Marsha also told me that John Hamley, the owner of the Halton Hilton, had passed away. I still feel badly that I was not here for my friend. I ended up basically passing out from the leg pain and shock from the news of my friend until the next morning, never unloading the car, and I had left my driver's side door open all night. The pain was still there, but I managed to unload the car and drive to the Halton Hilton to pay my own private respects. I walked up to the small wooden deck of the bar entrance. John had lived alone up above the bar, and I ended up heading up one last time. To my dismay, sitting on his Andorondock chair was the small wooden decorative box Smeagol had bartered for food. I was about to leave, 
and I had a strong urge to take it with me. I grabbed it and headed to my car. I put it in the box on the floor on the front passenger side, and then my leg began to have shooting pain. When I got home, I called Marsha and left a message. Despite the pain, I started to work on unpacking for my vacation. An hour or so later, I noticed the flies increasing. I had been combating the horrific stench by applying Vicks Vapo Rub to my chest and upper lip in a practice that I've seen in movies. And that's just the alarm telling me, Tim, that we've got a new caller that we'll go to right after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I've never heard anything like this. The tone conveyed extreme hate, pain, torture, anger, and violence. It was the strongest emotions I've ever felt from anything outside of my own being, if, if that makes any sense. These faint noises had turned into a groan and a growl and then shrieking at times. I slept in my car that night and woke up on a pillow soaked with blood from a gushing nosebleed, and I had a severe headache. I had never had a nosebleed. These headaches are common from the extended exposure to the stench. I went into the house to try to get the bleeding under control. Although the house, all through the house, I should say, I was being watched. It was extremely heavy, always something right behind me. I live alone in the woods and have never been afraid. But I tell you, I had a very healthy fear to look behind me in a sense that if I stepped backwards or moved too quickly, I would bump something in the air. It was a feeling of terror, but with no reason or rational explanation. It felt like the feeling I may have look, been looking into the eyes of an animal or a creature face to face that's about to rip me apart. I showered, dressed, and the nosebleed continued. I stood at my mirror in the bathroom looking for the cause and kept getting a strange tunnel vision, making things look darker than normal behind me. Between the constant exposure to flies, stench, demonic noises, the stress of my friend John's passing, a tremendous phantom leg pain, overwhelming and un unexplainable feelings of dread and fear and now a serious nosebleed and everything else with Smeagol, I was at my breaking point. I called Marsha, sharing all of this with her. I was told her I was heading to the hospital 40 minutes away. Guess what? As soon as I pulled out of the driveway, the nosebleed stopped. I was given a full exam, MRI, CT, lab work, but the causes of the bleed, leg pain, and headache were never determined. About 90 minutes into my stay, I sat up and told the nurse that all of a sudden my leg no longer hurt and the meds in the IV must be working. The nurse looked at me with a perplexed look and told me it had only been a regular saline solution for dehydration. No pain meds had been administered. I didn't care. I had relief. About five hours later, head-scratching medical professionals decided to discharge me. Marsha was in the waiting area, and when we got out to the parking lot, she told me that she had been to Smeagol's cabin to confront her, but she was packed and gone. Marsha was trembling and has never told me all that she saw, but she did... Show me a small faceless doll with the weird ruins and symbols on it. Marsha said she pulled two bloody needles out of the doll, one from the right leg, one from the face. Marsha told me that she had a friend that would meet us at my house later to helpfully clear everything up. She told me that the big box Smeagol had crawled out from was something called the Devil's Toy Box. There are six mirrors that face each other on each of the six sides of the inner cube. Occultists say it creates a back-and-forth energy loop, and people can summon and communicate with spirits. As a result, I did some research and found there are these so-called psychomantiums and found an interview with George Norrie and Joshua P. Warren on Coast to Coast. I showed her the box I had found in the Halton Hilton and told her about the noises and feelings at my house. We smashed open the box and it turned out to be a similar mini devil's toy box, a smaller version of the one in Smeagol's cabin. Inside were six small mirrors. We smashed them all at Marsha's direction. Later that evening at my house, her friend did what she called a cleansing with sage, a seashell and salt to clear away all the negative energy. When she was done, we heard a loud smashing, crackling sound, and the large mirror in my bathroom cracked down the middle with no sign of impact. We were all in the kitchen when the sound was heard. Some time has passed now, and so the flies and stench are not present. I don't see roadkill decorated with balloons and my name next to it. I have not had any more nosebleeds or phantom pains, but then again, no one has seen or heard from Smeagol since then either. This is all beyond weird. I don't blame anyone for doubting this. I wouldn't believe it if I wasn't living it. I'll keep in touch and thank you again for this outlet and allowing me to share this nightmare with you in the Army of Darkness, if you are kind enough to share it. And that comes from Mark in Belltown, Pennsylvania. We've got another call, Tim. You can give us a bus, 651-300-4977, and leave a voicemail message just like this one. Hey, Dave and Tim, um, this is Mr. Joshua, uh, lethal, we lethal Weapon 1 reference there for you guys. Um, I've been wanting to 
First of all, I'm a new fan. I've only been listening to you guys for about a month. I love you guys. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with your Beyond the Darkness show. I have several stories I want to share that I've experienced throughout my life. The first one, I've, I've been wanting to get off my chest for a while. I really don't know how to explain it. I wanted to get your take and, and ask you or the listeners what you or they think it was that I saw. Um, it's been over 20 years ago now. Uh, my my family had relocated to St. Albans, West Virginia. There's so many little details. Um, I'm going to try to cram it all in one message here. Um, back when I was in the fourth grade, my family relocated to St. Albans, West Virginia. And we lived kind of at the end of a cul-de-sac. And if, if you can imagine, if you can kind of picture, if you're driving in this very quiet neighborhood, on the right-hand side, the houses were on a flat they were on flat land, and on the left-hand side, there was about four houses that were down over on a hillside, and it was just a continuous drop, this hillside. That's, the, the houses were on stilts. That was one of our houses. Um, our first night there, it was at the end of the summer, and it was probably around 9 p.m. The sun's going down, so it's still light enough to where you can kind of see the outline of things, but it was dark enough to not see kind of what was standing out in front of you. Um, my older brother and me, we shared a room, and there was a sliding glass door that went out to a deck that was, of course, on stilts. If you were to walk out on this deck and look over, I mean, it's just a straight drop. If you jump off this deck, you would at least break your legs and your back, probably worse. But our first night there, we're getting ready for bed, and the blinds were kind of tilted open a little bit, and I heard a knock on the sliding glass door. And my brother says, who's that? And I I was just like, hey, it's, it's the kid from next door that we just met earlier that day. That's who it looked like from the outline. I, I propped the blinds to the side to look at this person. I couldn't make the person out. It was a body. It was a physical. I mean, the person was standing right in front of me, but it was just complete. The person was just a shadow because I could not see who it was just because it was so dark outside. So when I opened the blinds and, and saw this thing, it hissed at me. It put its hands up like it was making claw marks, like it was imitating a cat, and it hissed at me. Well, then it took a couple of steps back, looked at me again, got a running start, and completely hurdled the railing of the deck. And and that was it. I really didn't think much of it at the time, but now since I've been listening to your guys' show and um, and hearing other people's stories, I keep thinking, what was that on the deck that night? Um, and it's it's crazy. I mean, it's freaky when when I think about it. I mean, I just get chills, man. You know, it just doesn't it doesn't sound normal. <laughs> but anyhow, I wanted your take on it. Um, have you guys ever experienced something like that? If there are any other listeners that have experienced anything like that, um, I have other stories I'm going to be calling in and, and just kind of I want to tell you guys about. They're not very long. I promise to not be long-winded like, like I have been with this story. But um, I do have other stories that I would like to get your take on. Again, I'm a huge fan. You guys rock. Love you guys the best. And uh, I look forward to hopefully hearing my story. Thank you so much. Bye. By now, most of us have started racking our brains about what Valentine's gift is truly going to make her day special. With 1-800-Flowers.com, it's really not that complicated. Roses from 1-800-Flowers are a no-brainer. Right now, when you order early, 1-800-Flowers has amazing deals on vibrant and romantic Valentine rose bouquets, arrangements, and more, starting at just $29.99. Like at 18 romantic red roses for just $29.99. There are so many unbelievable deals from 1-800-Flowers, but you have to hurry. Now, one of the perfect examples, Tim, I was going through and looking for some different ones, and I I mentioned that I was going to get my wife a set for uh, Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found this really beautiful set that mixed a great assortment of flowers, the Sweetheart Medley Bouquet. Yep. And it has just about everything that my wife loves. But now I'm I'm torn because they have the new one called the Romantic Medley. Mm -hmm. And it's shipped in a gift box with a beautiful red vase, a box of chocolates. They're a mixture of red, white, and pink 
roses. And this is similar to the set I got for her last year, but it was mine last year was mixed with some tulips. They are gorgeous. And I'll tell you what, my wife absolutely loves the flowers I get her from 1-800-Flowers. The new romantic medley roses Or do I go with the Sweetheart Medley bouquet and give her kind of a wider variety of flowers, Tim? I'm confused. I'm a man. I don't know what to do in this situation. (laughs) But that's why I'm going to trust my friends at 1-800-Flowers. And give them a call, go through what I'm looking for, and have them help me decide on the best choice for me and for my wife. And they are also affordable right now. Why not give it a try? Again, roses from 1-800-Flowers are picked at their peak and shipped overnight to ensure freshness. And they will be amazing for that person that you love. Gorgeous Valentine bouquets and arrangements starting at just $29.99. Like that 18 romantic red roses for $29.99 is an amazing deal, but that's not going to last long. Bouquet prices will be going up soon, so take advantage today. Pick your delivery date and let 1-800-Flowers handle the rest. When it comes to Valentine's, I don't settle for anything less than my rose authority, 1-800-Flowers.com. 1-800-Flowers.com. To order Valentine bouquets, arrangements, and more, starting as low as just twenty nine ninety nine, like that 18 romantic red roses, go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Click on the radio icon and then enter the code DARKNESS. Order today, and you're going to save at 1-800-Flowers.com. Again, use that code DARKNESS. Click on the radio icon and put in the code DARKNESS at checkout to save. Go right now. Don't wait anymore. Place your orders because they are going to go fast. 1-800-Flowers.com. Hey, if you like our show, you're going to love Rob Has a Podcast on Podcast One. Join the biggest reality TV podcast around as Survivor's Rob Sestranino covers the current season of Celebrity Big Brother and more. Download Rob Has a Podcast every week on Podcast One, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. All right, Tim, we're back with a few more stories. Are you ready? I'm ready. Hello, Tim and Dave. I started listening to Darkness Radio this summer, and I'm a huge fan. I'm writing you today because I had a very strange encounter about two years ago. I was sitting outside probably between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. on a weekday with a friend watching the stars. We were in our college dorm room and sitting in a well-lit area outside the second floor. Suddenly, all the power went out for about two seconds, and the entire sky turned bright green, then bright blue, then dark blue, then back to darkness with stars. Both of us saw the exact same transition in the sky. And while we have had uh, and found a few similar stories online, neither of us have ever been able to find any explanation. I should mention that we were in central Florida, just outside of Tampa, near an Air Force base. I was hoping you all might have heard of similar occurrences. If so, I'd love to know more. If not, no worries. Thank you for a fascinating show. And that comes from Eric. Eric, I just got to say one thing. Cocaine, a hell of a drug, Tim. (laughs) Cocaine, a hell of a drug. Well, it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like it in this case. I'm just saying. Hey, gang. Hey. Wow. You want to be cool or the gang? Uh, Actually, Robert uh, Cool Bell has had a pretty good life. I might be cool. All right. Very cool. Hey, gang. Long time. First time. First off, I've been listening for about two years and I adore the show. I have had two experiences with the paranormal in my life. Once as a teenager that I love to recount to folks whom I become close with, or even with strangers on the same page, paranormal-wise, at cocktail parties, etc. I'll save that for another email. You son of a bitch. (laughs) The second, however, was an investigation last fall in Cripple Creek, Colorado. I was lucky enough to be a part of an established investigation group as a guest and participant. Ironically, the member that is team's resident videographer and a longtime friend of mine is one of those who turned me on to Darkness Radio. Dowsing rods, REM pods, EVPs, spirit boxes, two models of Ovilus devices, ghost grids, you name it, this group had it and the experience to back it up. It was amazing. I experienced more activity than I would have ever thought possible, even without being as much of a, or even though I was much of a skeptic by being called or being called out by name and pointed to with dowsing rods in a room of six people was enough to melt my brain, let alone seeing a child's toy skate across the floor of the nursery of a prison when spoken to. And don't get me started on the pedophile and murderers. Well, I, we communicated with them in the cell blocks, just one of three locations we investigated during that nine hours. There was so much that happened that night, it couldn't fit into an email that might be read on air, not the way I write anyway. Secondly, I wanted to say thank you and Tim and all of the other regulars 
are doing the good work, bringing this type of content to people day in and day out. And that comes from Kyle in Colorado. Thanks, Kyle in Colorado. He appreciate that. All right, our final story, Tim. It's a short one. Mm -hmm. Mandela Effect. Hello, Darkness Dave and Terrifying Tim. I have a Mandela Effect story for you. I could have sworn that Rip Torn was dead. I even remember watching the news and the lady saying, actor Rip Torn has died this morning, according to reports. They recast this role in the third Men in Black film, saying his character had died. So I went on thinking he was dead. Then suddenly he showed up on my TV again, very much alive. Am I crazy? Or did I cross dimensions briefly? Insert Rod Serling voice in Twilight Zone theme here. Take care. That comes from Kurt from Buckeye, Arizona. I don't know what to tell you, Kurt. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> that sound about right? You know, I, I might back him on this one. You thought that uh, Rip Torn was dead, too? Was it, was it Rip Taylor who died? Or Rip Taylor. No, both of them are still alive. No, did Rip Torn die? Because Rip Torn is the guy from the Larry Sanders show and Men in Black, right? That's what I thought. Hold on a second. Let me. I'm, I'm grabbing. I'm grabbing the old Google. You're machine. dragging it. Yeah, I'm grabbing it. Um, uh huh. Rip Torn. Uh huh. American actor. Uh huh. Okay. Rip Torn, American actor. I'm bringing it up on the old Google machine. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, I'm hitting the old Wikipedia link, but it doesn't seem to be coming up. Okay. Let's see. Uh huh. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. age 88, it says he's still active. It doesn't say he's passed bum, away. Bum, bum. I could have swore he died, too, because now I'm looking at, he was in Men in Black. Yeah. And I could have swore he passed away. Do, 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 You've now entered the Twilight Zone. But Rip Taylor was the comedian. He was the one who threw right. the, conf- the oh, confetti. Oh, and, and throwing he, all the stuff in the air, right? Yeah, and, and he he's been in the Jackass movies. But he's the one who people always get Rip Torn con- confused with. I so, don't know. So don't know. maybe Both of them that's are rips. so maybe that's the deal. Because Rip ta- is Rip Taylor dead too? Well, let me check. Let me pull up. I the think old he Google did machine. just die like a year or two ago. I think I think it was maybe a little bit more than that. But here I'm pulling mm-hmm. up the old Google machine. I'm pulling uh-huh. up the old Wikipedia, and. Uh, Rip Taylor. Well, I'll be damned. He's not dead either. Dun, dun, dun. A double Mandela <sighs> effect. We've been double dipped like an Oreo cookie of mystery, Tim. It says that he's 84 and he's still active. Crazy. Well, what the hell am I thinking then? Cocaine's a hell of a drug, Tim. Hmm. Psychic Source wants to remind you that your life path doesn't have to be a mystery. It's okay to ask for a little guidance sometimes, and you'll be so glad you did. Try your first reading today at a super discounted rate of only three eighty-three cents a minute. That's only eighty-three cents a minute. Don't forget to mention promo code Darkness when you call or sign up online at PsychicSource.com. Still not sure? Save their number just in case. One eight hundred three five five nine two one four. One eight hundred three five five nine two one four. Or check them out and sign up online at PsychicSource.com. And remember to use promo code on either the phone call or online to book the best deal. First three minutes free and every minute after just 83 cents a minute for a 30 minute reading. Make sure you take advantage of that now again at psychicsource.com or 1 800 355 9214. That's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow when we talk about a woman who dealt with a very, very strange dark presence in her home, Tim, that, that she believes was a demonic force busy at work uh and this is a very weird creepy story and for theater of the mind we've got kind of something a little different and unique uh talk about weird synchronicity as i talk to this woman about coming on the show tim Mm -hmm. again i don't know if it's ai listening into my phone call (laughs) i go out and there's an article that pops up and it says listen to audio from the first televised home exorcism okay And we've got that audio from Mm -hmm. the newscast, that Mm -hmm. original story. And that's from, I think, 1971 or 74 or something like that. So we're going to play that as part of Theater of the Mind tomorrow so you can actually hear the original news story. The the audio quality is great. It's groovy and popping and crackly and old, and it sounds perfect. So you don't even have to put any special effects behind it, Tim. Uh, So that'll be tomorrow's Theater of the Mind. We'll be back again with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader, and this is Beyond the Darkness. 